long before anyone used the term highly selective for colleges like Davidson. I knew it was. And it was clear from the first few minutes on campus that many of the students were highly privileged. It was also clear to me that I was decidedly not. But I figured a shared commitment to the place and the mission would level the playing field, put us on common ground, create a landscape where race and gender didn't really matter. But on a spring day in 1992, I walked into some truth. I walked right into the Civil War. Now, that's not how my classmates saw it. They were not, as they explained to me, glorifying slavery. They were celebrating a time when chivalry was alive and when women sat on verandas sipping mint juleps. We all know who built those porches, grew that mint, and then made and served those juleps. So I had to challenge that narrative. And once I started, I never stopped. In fact, challenging that narrative and everything it perpetuates has made me into what I am today. A diversity pragmatist. Someone who looks for objective ways to deal with some highly subjective issues. For me, the focus is race. And right now, I stay pretty busy. Because right now, everybody is talking about race. Not diversity, but race. We all know why. And what we know should make us challenge everything we thought we knew about diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, choosing to challenge was what women all over the world raised our hands for in 2021. Choosing to challenge is what all of us are here to talk about today. What does it mean to challenge? How do you know where to start? What can one person one company actually do? The answer, I believe, is a whole hell of a lot. Challenging for change is a three-step process. Choose, commit, commence. Challenge is a choice. We have to speak up, lean in, and take a stand. You have to pick a side. But you ask which side? What challenge do you choose? Great questions, of course. But let me suggest that instead of asking which or what, start with why. Simon Sinek, author, organizational consultant, and TED speaker, describes his thinking process as the golden circle. He says most organizations can tell you what and how, but only a few know why. I believe that's also true for challenges. Successful challenges start with why. So what is your why? Your why drives you to want change and to be willing to lead it. Your why is shaped with the words, I believe. So what do you believe about injustice, inequity, inclusion? Find your why, because ultimately your why becomes your what. And that brings us to the second step in challenging for change. Commitment. Everyone here has already committed to one challenge, changing the landscape of leadership. That's Nerdy Girl Success's big, hairy, audacious goal. That's your why. But how do you make your why your what? Whether you're committing to challenge as a person or as an organization, start with what you know. Allow me to share an example. Before I joined the Neural Leadership Institute, I was a speechwriter for the CEO at UPS. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd died after a Minneapolis police officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, sparking global protests against racism and police brutality. Exactly one week later, on June 1st, 2020, Carol Tomei officially assumed the role of CEO of UPS. In her first statement to UPSers as CEO, she vowed to turn her anger about racism and inequity into action. Shortly thereafter, on a Saturday morning, a cross-functional team of UPS leaders came together to see if there was a way to make Carol's aspirational statement actionable. And the UPS Equity, Justice, and Action Task Force was born. 
fighting racism and inequity was what Carol chose to challenge. Building a framework for action was how we committed to that challenge. We started with why. Because we believe inclusion and diversity are essential to innovation and success, which led us to what? Combat racism by promoting justice and equity, where systemic racism persists and UPS is best positioned to move the needle. That last part was the most important. When you're a global company with more than 500,000 employees, there's a lot you can do. And when you choose to challenge things as big as racism and inequity, there's a lot you need to do. But committing to challenge is about deciding what you will do. And since no single company can do everything, we focused on what we already knew how to do, our core competencies. As a communicator on the team, I started looking for ways to make sense of things. I knew racism is systemic, so that's where we have to fight it. I knew UPS already had a presence in the judicial, economic, cultural, healthcare, and education systems. I knew who our diversity and inclusion stakeholders were, employees, customers, suppliers, the community. That's where we could do the most good, where we could best commit to challenge. Everyone started throwing out ideas, so I started drawing pictures, connecting dots, because that's my core competency. That's how we started. This is where we landed. This framework is one of the things that I'm proudest to have created because with a paper towel and a Sharpie, I'm helping to shape one of the world's biggest companies' commitment to challenge, one of the world's biggest problems. And that's what the third step in challenging for change is all about. You found your why. You've engaged your core. It's time to commence. When you choose and commit to challenge inequity, commence on every level, personally and professionally, interpersonally, organizationally, structurally. Let me explain what I mean by that. The isms of inequity, racism, sexism, ableism, sizeism, etc., operate on three levels. Interpersonal inequity happens in interactions between individuals. It's prejudice, having negative attitudes towards a different race or culture. It's bias, the brain-based tendency to favor those who are similar, surrounding, or safe. It's what we usually think about when we talk about workplace racism and sexism. But it's really not the biggest problem. Organizational inequity happens when institutions do things like they've always done. It's status quo, not rocking the boat, letting things evolve, organic change. In theory, that works. In reality, some people have privilege. The workplace wasn't always equitable. It won't get that way by wishing and waiting. That's organizational inequity. Structural inequity is the bigger system within which this all plays out. Structural inequity is cumulative, pervasive, and durable. It's often mislabeled, misunderstood, and therefore denied. But once you know where inequity exists, you can commence the challenge to fight it. Start with yourself. Look inside and check your unconscious bias. If you have a brain, you have bias. It's biological, it's how humans reduce the number of decisions we have to make, how we find our tribes, how we survive. Bias is biology, but unmitigated bias can lead to bigotry. I work for a company that develops solutions to mitigate bias, so yes, I know it's possible. And once you start working on your bias, you can be an ally. That starts with having what I like to call 5A conversations. Ask the people who live the experience. Absorb what they have to say. Listen. Accept that what they say is true. I didn't say acknowledge. I said accept. 
adjust your own beliefs, accepting that beliefs are not truths, and then articulate. Tell the truth, take a stand, be an ally. Next, commence the challenge on an organizational level. No matter where you sit on the org chart, you can be an ally in the workplace. But if you're in a decision-making position, you can fight inequity by advancing what I like to call 3RDEI. 3RDEI comprises three things. Identifying real problems, assigning real measures, instituting real consequences. And the operative word is real. Real problems, those are the things that diversity can really solve uniquely. In any good business decision, the first question before deploying any resource is, what are we solving for? Diversity is an asset, which makes equity a strategic advantage. And if you identify the problems diversity solves in your company, then it's a lot easier to make equity a strategic imperative. In inclusive companies, real problems are the ones that leverage diversity to address real issues. Real problems are measured with real numbers. Forget about aspirational goals. Do you have aspirational quality goals, aspirational sales goals? No. You have metrics that make sense, metrics that mean something, metrics that align with your strategic priorities. What if we assign metrics like that to equity? What if we set inclusion goals, establish benchmarks, move beyond the short-term linear assessments to really understand the value that equity and inclusion bring? One thing we know for sure, what gets measured is what gets done. And we also know that what is incentivized is prioritized. As important as measuring is, measures don't matter if consequences don't count. In business and in life, people do what they are incentivized to do, period. Start attaching some carrots or sticks to inclusion and equity metrics and just watch what happens. Equity is no different than any other business imperative. So what if we treated it like one? Business, more than any other entity, is situated to make structural change. Business has the resources, the talent, the know-how, and the need. But we must commence the challenge to change things. One person, one company, one industry at a time, but all working together. And it's not just inside the walls of our homes and offices, but in the streets, through activism. Because that's how you dismantle structures. Inside out, outside in, top down, bottom up. It's about being the change you want to see on every level. And I believe you can do it. Let me close by offering my life as a case study. I chose to challenge and found my why. I believe business can dismantle racism and disrupt inequity. I committed to challenge by doing what I do, communicating. And I commenced the challenge interpersonally by being the voice of those who might not have one, organizationally by connecting dots and building frameworks for action, and structurally by whispering in the ears and shaping the voices of leaders, and then sharing what I've learned on every soapbox or stage my feet could find, including this one. And there is no place I'd rather be. Because I believe we are the ones who can do this work. So I charge you, choose to challenge, find your why. Commit to challenge, engage your core. Commence to challenge, do the work. I believe we are the ones that our companies and the world have been waiting for. And I believe today is as good a day as any to start. Shall we? Thank you.